and welcome to the Abundology Podcast. I'm here today with Amanda Farron, who is a speaker, coach, and educator on emotional wellness, grief, and revolutionary self-care. So I'm excited to talk with you today because uh, this yes. is you know, one of the hot topics that we have here. So how, Amanda, welcome. And how did you get started in this? Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's been kind of a long and tumultuous journey. So I've always worked in mental health and back in 2013 and 14, I had a mental health job where they wanted us to make sure we were prioritizing self-care because of course, you know, vicarious trauma and all these other things we were facing on a daily basis, but they began to micromanage it and really kind of co-opt it and take over how we did our own self-care. And that just felt really gross. And it's like, well, it's self care like for myself and it's very personal and the fact that you're like micromanaging it doesn't feel like it's truly care either anymore and in the midst of that I lost my grandmother who was my person mm-hmm. and it was a very hard loss and yet I had to just come right back to work and jump into this toxic job and thankfully it didn't last much longer and I was let go and it was a blessing <laughs> and jumped right back into the, you know, human services field and just kept going amidst all these things going on, decided to go to grad school, started the MS, the Masters of Social Work program at PSU. And my dad began to lose his battle with cancer. So I took a break from school, went home and was with him in his final weeks, then went right back to school and then took a break and came home while my grandpa passed away and then went right back to school. And then had my pet that had been by my side for 10 years get terminally ill, put her to sleep, started school the next week. And then finals that Christmas, my grandma was dying. So packed up all my stuff, came home and finished my finals at her bedside in the hospital as she passed away. Went back to school that next, you know, term. And then I hit a wall. I had not been taking care of myself for a very long time, emotionally, physically, mentally, and I couldn't do it anymore. I could no longer be in a program where I was learning to take care of everybody else's mental health and needs and not take care of my own. And I quit grad school. I pulled out and said, you know, at first it was just gonna take a break and take some time to take care of myself. And then I realized that grad school was just no, no longer what I wanted. And I took about two years. And that year, those two years were full of a lot of ups and downs. My mental health got worse before it got better. I actually got my dog and he started as a service dog in training and then he had to retire because he has bad knees. So (laughs) another loss, right? And so it just continued to have losses. I've lost friends. I've lost more family. And I finally, you know, I was seeing a therapist. I was doing all this work on myself, you know, obviously being in the mental health field my whole life, I had all these tools and I'm like, I know the tools. Let's start using the tools and just really worked hard on getting healthy again and getting in control of my emotional health and mental health. And last November was like, you know what? I'm feeling good enough to pay this forward. Like it's time to kind of step back into the world. I don't want to go back into any more toxic work environments where I'm not in control. So what can I do? And I realized I could become a coach and that my areas of not only work experience, education, but lived experience would allow me to be an amazing emotional wellness, grief, and revolutionary self-care coach. Yeah. And educator. Yeah. um, And especially, I think people can probably right now, and we'll talk about a little bit of grief from coronavirus here in a second. But before we get there, can you just break it down? What exactly does emotional wellness mean? And how do you know how emotionally well you are? And (laughs) yes. So obviously I'm a believer, you know, that we've got our wellness wheel and there's the six different components or spokes and emotional wellness is one of them. Yes. And that's where we kind of, you know, emotions are not good or bad. They're not right or wrong. Instead, they are messengers. They have something to tell us. And unfortunately, overwhelmingly in our culture, it is, you know, we don't want to talk about emotions. We don't want to talk about feelings and it's this fight with our egos, right? Our egos want to keep us, um, you know, in the present and not focused on the past or the future, 
you know, so it tries to disregard all of our emotions. And instead, when we focus on our emotional wellness, we recognize that our emotions are messengers there to tell us something and we need to listen. <laughs> yeah. And when we listen, we're able to then respond in our lives in a way that honors those emotions and gets us on a path of wellness versus ignoring them, stuffing our emotions, and then having, you know, other, you know, somatic issues, health issues, et cetera, because we aren't acknowledging and allowing our emotions to be felt and heard. So I'm a big believer in name it to tame it. So like you've got to name the emotions in order to respond to them appropriately. So, you know, an emotion that is sometimes deemed as bad or negative is anger. My belief is that anger is always a secondary emotion. There's always something else under the anger. So if we listen to the anger, we can usually find out what's underneath it and then respond and calm that anger, get back to a balanced state and respond in a calm, stress-free way. So we need to label our emotions for what they are, acknowledge what they are there to tell us, accept what they have to tell us, and then respond accordingly. And that's where I help people is in learning not only how to label and acknowledge them, but accept them and then respond accordingly and develop those plans for care so that they find balance and they aren't overwhelmed or stressed or burnt out. Um, and when you achieve emotional wellness, you're able to hold compassion for yourself and others. You're aligned with who you want to be. And doesn't that sound lovely? Don't we all want to fearlessly and authentically be who we want to be? We're able to cope and we have more skills and ability to be adaptable. So when things like coronavirus or pandemics happen or loss or other things in our life that we maybe weren't expecting, we have ability to cope. We've got tools in our toolbox. We're able to practice and hold gratitude, which how beautiful is that? We're able to hold space for and feel a great emotional range. And I believe like you can't experience true unadulterated joy unless you've known the opposite of just absolute grief or despair, right? You have to have felt, it's the yin and the yang, the balance, right? The black and the white. And you can't have one without the other. You have to know how to truly step into and live in one to truly embrace and experience the other. And it gives you purpose and value in life when you are balanced emotionally. So. Yeah, and I think in our society, we are not used to, um, dealing with our emotions, you know, one, we're not taught as young kids to even acknowledge what's going on. You know, immediately it's like, you're fine, just get up and, you know, and so we don't even get in touch with them. We don't know what they're saying. And then as we get older, we've all experienced some level of depression or sadness or whatever, but you know, what do you do? You overeat, you drink, you, you know, binge, what, whatever it is, you don't really look at the emotion and what it's telling you. And then you just find yourself in that cycle, you know? Yes. It, yeah. And then as you know, it takes a little bit more work to get out of it once, you know, versus just looking at the emotions. Right, because that depression or anxiety that you're feeling that if you don't acknowledge it and accept it and then do what it's trying to tell you, it can then fight with the ego in terms of shame and guilt and other things that are even harder to work yourself out of. Mm, good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. So how are you um, seeing us as a country dealing with coronavirus? Because there's so much grief around this. And let's be real, a lot of us right now are not in the best places emotionally as we would like to be. So um, what have you gleaned that you can share that will help us with this? <laughs> it's okay to cry. It is totally okay to cry. I think I cry five to six days out of seven. And that's okay. Because in those moments, when I find those tears coming up, what I do is I sit with it for a minute and I try to understand what it's telling me. Am I tired? Am I overwhelmed? Am I feeling some sort of empathy or compassion for what's going on either in my life, someone else's life or the world? And then I know what I can do with it, right? Like if I'm tired, I can go take a nap or I can go to bed a little earlier. 
if I am feeling overwhelmed, then I can use my coping tools for that, right? Do I need to make lists? Do I need to look at my calendar and see what I can shift and prioritize? Um, you know, what am I taking on that I can say no to? Because a big part of what I preach in my practice is boundaries mm. and that it's okay to say no and that it's okay to just, you know, have very healthy and clear boundaries in all areas and ways in your life, especially as women. We aren't always good about that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I just really try to sit with those emotions, right? And again, if anger or frustration come up, I sit with that, try to see what's underneath it because it's gonna then tell me how to respond. And where I work with clients in this is they don't always know how to respond, right? If they right. know how to name it, they might not know how to tame it. So I help people tame it. And right now with coronavirus, I think the first step is because in our culture, we're not always good about naming it, is just naming it, right? Just figuring out what it is and having some compassion for yourself and for that emotion and just holding a little bit of space for it, right? Very gently very kindly and just having that compassion for yourself. And yes, we are going through this globally, but everyone's response is going to be different because we all have different lived experiences. We all have different coping skills. We all have different experiences with trauma or loss or grief, um, cultural, spiritual beliefs and backgrounds. So this is going to be, and grief itself has different processes, right? So we all might be in a different space, right? So somebody that's in bargaining, maybe they don't want to wear a mask or they don't believe that this is as bad as it really is. Whereas somebody else that's in a different phase is going to get mad at that person that's in bargaining. Yeah. Like, Why don't you understand? Why don't you see it my way? So again, just taking a deep breath, having some space and some compassion for yourself and for others is my biggest recommendation. That's a really good point because we forget, are there five stages of grief? There's actually now, um, Kessler has added a six. Okay. Can you tell um, us briefly what those are? You know, you put me on the spot. <laughs> and as a grief coach, I would normally know. And of course, that, that's fine. Don't worry about it. I know that we have the ang What One of them is anger. Yes. You know, There's and the other. Anger, denial, bargaining. Why am I? Oh, this is horrible for a grief coach, right? Oh, that's, a, that's fine. Because you deal with the emotions. I want the, the, the labels. But that's really interesting that we, um, we think that everybody's in the same stage as us. You know, if we're in the anger stage, we can't understand why everybody else isn't angry with us. Right. Or the bargaining. That, to me, just you saying that explains so much about how people don't want to wear a mask and they think everything is fine you know, where the other people are like angry right now. So fascinating that we're just in these different varying stages of grief. Right. And if somebody has lost somebody to COVID or even not, like I have a friend that lost her niece very tragically, but she can't go home, right? The family can't have a funeral. Yeah. They had to say goodbyes via Zoom, right? And so some of their anger is coming from the fact that people keep doing things that are making this, you know, everything is getting extended and extended and extended and it's not safe for these families to go and have these rites and rituals of closure that they want to have for their loved ones. And so their anger might be coming from that space, right? So again, everybody's lived experiences is going to contribute to how they're feeling emotionally in this moment very differently. Right. That's very, such a good point. What are some of the ways that we can take care of ourselves emotionally during this time? I know that we, you know, I love to talk about self-care here and <laughs> radical self-care, which you're an expert at. So are there some things that we can all do that would take care of ourselves more during this time? So one of the biggest things, and this is a little term that I have coined, is finding yourself a compassion companion mm. or two or three. I love so it. Find somebody that you can check in with. And you know what? I did a little bit of market research because I was thinking about shifting my niche a little bit. And I just want to say to the mamas out there, I found out that my mom friends weren't reaching out for support from people that they normally would reach out from because they were busy. And if they were busy, then everybody else they knew was busy too. Okay. And they didn't want to be a bother. Well, I say, forget that. Reach out, find yourself a friend, ask because they might need it too. So find yourself somebody that you can be those compassion companions with where you check in, maybe it's once a week or 
every other day and just kind of, you know, hey, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? How can I support you? Another thing I've done, I've brought snail mail back. I love sending letters and cards. <laughs> and so I, and I'm also a crafter. Like if you can see this visually, like I've got my craft room behind oh, yeah. me. So I've been making little things to send to people. Um, just, you know, when people can open their mailbox and get a little bit of love and appreciation instead of a bill or <laughs> something else, you know, that can brighten their day and shift their whole mood. Um, and journaling right now, wow. not only because, you know, having a record of what this time is like for future generations, but it is such a great tool for emotional wellness. Because if you can sit and just free write and dump things out, you might end up with things on the page that you didn't even realize about yourself. And if people like prompts, I do have a Pinterest page under Value Yourself Coaching, and it is full of journal prompts. Wonderful. So, um, you know, if you can spend just five minutes a day, set a timer and just brain dump or whatever, however you want to develop that writing practice, journaling is huge for emotional wellness. Um, I think that emotional wellness partners very much with spiritual wellness. And this is a time to find new rites and rituals, right? Because graduations, proms, all these key things, weddings, everything, right? That are part of our spring and summer rites and rituals aren't happening. Online is a great space, right? All these things are turning to online, but that can lead to burnout too, right? Zoom burnout is real. So creating new rites and rituals to take care of yourself are phenomenal. I use tea as part of my self-care. Um, I use, I know she's local here to those of us in Portland, Leslie Abrams, Yo Soy Candles. I love her candles. Um, I'm a little bit witchy and woo-woo-y, so I have my crystals and I have my different things that I do there. Um, you know, but just whatever spiritually speaks to you finding new rites and rituals that kind of help you meditation. I've actually written a couple meditations and we'll be getting those out into the world um, and just incorporating daily mindfulness, right? And finding ways that it doesn't mean you have to find 20 minutes in your day that you don't know that you already have, right? It can be in the shower. It can be in a practice of something you're already doing in the car and wherever, and just kind of taking that moment to internally check in with yourself and being real on how you're doing. I love these, this idea of the rituals because um, I live downtown and there's so many things that aren't, you know, there's, there's, we have lots of farmer's markets downtown and none of the parades and the Rose Festival and, you know, the, the Fleet Week, all of those things. And they seem like they're just, you know, it's okay, we can miss it. But the, those are all touch points in how the year is going. Fleet Week comes in, then you know it's graduation, then you know it's the Rose Festival and the parades and all of those. I think I'm grieving just for yes. those little things that are that are not part of my life this year. You know, nobody's dead. It's not, and I think that's somewhere where we think, well, my grief isn't as bad as their grief. You know, and then we judge ourselves a little bit in that, or we don't allow ourselves to grieve because it's, we shouldn't be because their grief is worse. Right. And I've had some major things I was looking forward to kind of taken away this year, right? And I couldn't relate to it in any other way in the moment other than feeling like the child that had all of her favorite toys taken away for no reason, right? Uh -huh. And one of them was, I'm part of a speaker's program. And we were supposed to have an international competition in July in Colombia. Well, that was going to be my birthday present to myself. Well, now it has to be next year's birthday present to myself. Right, right. And I don't know if you know about World Domination Summit here in Portland. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's right. Yeah. They always have it right around my house. So, right. yes. So, this year was supposed to be the last year. Well, oh, nope. I didn't next know that. year. Next year will be the last year. Yeah. And so all these things I was looking forward to, yes, have been taken away, right? So that is a process of grief because you're grieving either not seeing people you would normally see during those times or it marks, like you said, a point in your year that has, you know, and those things live in our bodies. Oh, yeah. Those memories, those moments, those times live in our bodies. So again, that can play out in our physical health and well-being. 
But if we tap into the emotional piece of it and take care of ourselves emotionally and do the other self-care that we need to do, then those physical symptoms subside and we're physically healthier as well. That makes sense. But also, I, going back to the rituals, I now, I've always loved full moons and new moons, yes. but I haven't really ever done the rituals, you know? So now it's like a perfect time, like, oh, it's, it's a new moon. Let me do the new moon ritual. So just these little things now, I'm looking forward to the next new moon. It's interesting how... Yes. Um, even on Sunday nights, I, you know, light the candles, put some music on, do some journaling. Now that's become my Sunday night thing, you know? Nice. So just adding those in has made me feel so much better, you know? Yes. yes so much better. So. And even if it's, I'm all about balance, right? Like it doesn't have to be, if it's, you need an hour of Netflix or Hulu at night, like Absolutely. whatever it is, right? It's all about balance and tapping into truly what you need. Um, I read something, so folks with high anxiety like to rewatch old shows they've already watched because they know what's gonna happen. Not, there's no unpredictable moments. So go find a show that you've already watched that you love that can bring you that comfort and that sense of like familiarity, right? Do whatever it is that is going to bring you that like balance and calm and centering where you can hold that compassionate space for yourself and just take care of yourself, right? And just take care of ourselves, yes. Yes. <laughs> Even if you're watching Friends for the third or fourth time through, it doesn't matter. It's okay. <laughs> but I love that. I, I hadn't thought about that of watching old movies because, because right now, nothing. We, nobody knows how anything is going to turn out. We have this you know, level of uncertainty that many of us have never felt in our lives. You know, right. so... But I will see, you said something earlier on about when you were grieving and you had all this loss and you can't really experience the, the highs without the lows. And, um, you know, I've lost my husband when I was younger and then I lost my second husband too, you know, just a couple of years ago. Um, but that grief, I have to say, horrible, yes, but one of the best things that ever happened to me because I, I it just was I was able to expand my range of emotions. I didn't know I could feel that fucking great until I felt that fucking bad, you know? Right. So that is to me and one of the benefits of what's happening now, like we feel bad, like this is yucky, you know? But when this is over, just feel, I just can't wait to someday go to a concert again, how much I'm gonna appreciate the asshole sitting next to me, you know, where before I would have hated it. <laughs> now I'm in a concert, yay! <laughs> Well, and so I live alone. I haven't had a hug in over eight weeks. Yeah. I didn't realize what hugs meant to me because there was a period in my life where hugs didn't feel good because I was getting more funeral and pity hugs than other types of hugs, right? So hugs actually became really kind of uncomfortable because they felt like they were coming from a space of like, oh, I'm so sorry for you. Right. And I just in the last few months of going out and networking and meeting all these fabulous people and building all these great relationships and getting all these great hugs again, right? That didn't feel attached to pity or sympathy in yucky ways. And then to have that all taken away all of a sudden. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I really liked hugs. And I didn't realize how much. And as someone with chronic illness and chronic pain, I was getting a massage every other week. Yes. I haven't had a massage in over eight weeks. So that's leading to physical symptoms that I'm having to now manage with new and different types of self-care. But it's like, yeah, so what is going to happen when I get that first hug again? Am I going to go like, it's like, am I going to completely fall apart on the person's shoulder and like hug them for way too long and make them extremely uncomfortable? Or are we all going to come out of this with a new sense of compassion for ourselves and for others? And that's my hope for the world is that we have a lot more compassion for ourselves and for others, right? We're learning just how hard nurses and doctors and healthcare workers work. We're learning how hard teachers work and have a new appreciation for teachers, right? And I just really hope that we do come out on the other side of this more loving, kind, and compassionate, taking better care of ourselves and each other. That's wonderful. Yes, I think that that's everybody's wish, you know, yes. So you offer something um, called a free discovery call. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? 
Right. So part of my model is I want to be accessible and affordable to all. So I start all my services with folks with a free discovery call. So they can book that through my website. And it's just a half an hour where we chat about what they're going through, what they've got going on to see if I'm a great match for them and how we can work together. Or if they just need a half an hour of somebody to chat with, we can just chat it out in that half an hour. Um, and it's a way to kind of start that relationship and build and see if it's something that they want to keep building on and if I can meet their needs and help them with what they want to um, achieve. And so they can go to your website, which is valueyourselfcoaching.com. Correct. Okay, yeah. great. I'll, I'll make sure I put the link to, in the show notes for that too. So um, are there any words of wisdom that you could leave us with about the grieving and the grief that we're feeling this time and and how to perhaps get, you gave us some great ideas of, of activities to do, but. Um, again, grief is another emotion, right? That's there to tell us something. And so do your best to have compassion and embrace what it's trying to tell you. Be gentle and kind with yourself and know that when you feel grief, it typically is coming from a place of love. So on the other side of that grief is a love, a love, for either yourself or a love for our humanity, you know, in these times of COVID or a hope for what we want to see. And so just respect that duality and honor that and embrace that and just take good care of yourself in knowing that you're not alone and it's okay if you're not okay. And it's okay to have all the big feelings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. I've loved talking with you today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.